Hello, everyone. This is You've Got Five Options, a radio show where we prove that five is a magic number. Our experts will give you five tips on how to make your private or professional life better. We will solve your life challenge by giving you five different options to choose from. And our guests will answer five exciting questions while live on air. Tune in and feel the magic of five. Hello, everyone. This is Marta. And this is Anna. And this is You've Got Five Options show, where we have another very special guest. Yes, and I would like to just, for the record, say that our guests are all special to me. There are no more or less special guests. I just sometimes have a problem with expressing that properly. So we have definitely a very special, at least as special as, as Stoyan, who was our guest before guest. Jan. Hello, Jan. Hello, hello. Can you say like your full name? Because I don't want to, you know, spoil it. Okay, my name is Jan Rezek. Great. So we have Jan today and we will be talking Expat Entrepreneurship 101. Oh, yeah. So this is like a really exciting topic and we are looking forward to learning a lot from Jan. And in today's show, Jan will present his five strategies on how to fulfill the role of expat entrepreneur one-on-one. And we will also have some questions that we have received from our listeners. So we will also ask Jan to answer those questions. But for starters, I would like you, Jan, to tell us, who are you? Okay, who am I? This was a question that I was obviously expecting. No way. Not that I prepared for that, though. Um, um, I'm... Jan, originally from Czech Republic, um, living in Denmark for the last four years. I came for studying, but then it turned into more of a colorful life of entrepreneurship and studying at the same time. I'm a constantly not satisfied person, which is a part of my DNA and which is part of an entrepreneurial DNA. That's what I would love to believe. And yeah, I'm a little bit of a life weirdo, I would say, because things in my life go either the best way or the worst way possible. Nothing in between. So I love this life weirdo, this expression. Tell us a little bit more about being a life weirdo. Um, Yeah. So things in my life, like I said, go either the best way possible or the worst way possible. I have probably never experienced anything that will go just in the middle, just the balanced way. So either I go really high or really down. And that's weird, at least to me, because normally people go balanced middle way uh not me okay okay uh well uh, first of all wow it's like i know you for like what two months and now you are coming up with this weirdo identity and this up and down i think there is a lot of things i would like to ask you about but just to have it confirmed four years of being entrepreneur here in denmark yes and in czech republic have you also tried entrepreneurship yes so how many years in total are you an ent- entrepreneur? Since um, since 19, actually. Since you were 19? Yeah. And I just recently turned 27. So that makes it quite some years. Quite some years. Okay. Yeah, because in, uh, in your bio that you have sent to us, you called yourself serial entrepreneur. Um, so. Just to reflect on that, people, some people call me serial entrepreneur. I never actually... I never wanted to to call myself a serial entrepreneur because to me, when someone says serial entrepreneur, I imagine a person with like 500 years of experience and, and, you know, being funded by in Series A and Series B, having multi-billion dollars uh, startups, which is not me, unfortunately. However, I use that expression because that's how people refer to me sometimes. But I think this is a really cool expression. And if you have tried a series of entrepreneurship experiences, you are a serial entrepreneur. So then you just confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I can be now one of those people that call you this way. <laughs> so that's cool. Okay, Jan, I would like to ask you to tell us what you came here to talk to us about today and why. Okay. So I came here today to tell a little bit more about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. 
there are a lot of myths that I would like to debug and I would like to talk about because people typically have this romantic idea about being an entrepreneur as a as a dream job and don't really follow up on things that actually go wrong all the time because being an entrepreneur it's a constant struggle and I would like to tell people a little bit more about what it takes and also what it takes to be an entrepreneur in a country which is not your origin which is not your mother country and yeah so so that's why I'm here today and I really really hope to to transfer this this knowledge I've I've gathered so I'd like to jump in here with a question from Kate because I think it's very relevant here already at the beginning, because Kate is asking, what makes someone an entrepreneur? Kate says, I keep telling myself I am not, and I say that I have no interest. However, I am making an initiative to help internationals in lending or getting a job in Denmark, and I don't plan on this ever becoming a business. In my opinion, it is a bad business model because I want to do it genuinely to help people and believe that I should not do it for the money. Because I am doing this initiative, does this make me an entrepreneur? Or do you consider this more as a personal branding? What are your thoughts? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the term entrepreneur. I think there is a big buzz around this word and things that people consider to be entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur, which are in particular not true. So first of all, the definition of, of an entrepreneur is a person who is constantly looking for innovative things. It's for making things, processes better, smoother, faster, stronger, you name it. It's what it takes to be constantly not satisfied because you're constantly challenging the status quo. You're constantly trying to make things better, like I said before. And there is a big difference between being an entrepreneur and being self-employed because Being an entrepreneur means that you have it in your DNA. You have it as a mindset. And I actually heard Kate speaking the other day and she said, she she told a story about how she tried to sell stuff when she was a little kid. And that's something that I really consider to be this specific DNA of an entrepreneur. You have it, you have it in you. you. You were born with this. That's why I say you cannot learn to be a true entrepreneur. You can be self-employed, perfectly fine. But being an entrepreneur, it's about the mindset and the DNA you're born with, in my perception. Okay. Uh, I hope that Kate can be satisfied with that answer. And Anna, tell us. What no, I actually think. wanted to say that it's quite funny uh, that you said that because you said that you want to de-romanticize the entire entrepreneurship, right? Which you will do by debunking probably a couple of things that people normally think because you have your five strategies or tips. And yet somehow it is quite a romantic definition of an, uh, of an entrepreneur that I hear from you. You have it in your DNA. So I found it interesting to, to listen to it. So now I will ask you, do you really think you cannot learn how to be an entrepreneur? You really have to be born with it. Is it a, a mindset that you think is an inborn think innate think to a person okay so entrepreneurship to me is really highly tied and connected to your temper Mm -hmm. temper is something you're born with character personal character is something you can actually learn you can improve that you can bend it but temper is something you're born with and entrepreneurship is really tied to to your temper in my opinion and my experience of myself and people that i've met who are true entrepreneurs i think that's a very interesting approach And I think that I don't have an opinion myself whether you have to be born with entrepreneurship or whether it's something that you can discover in you later in life. I have not defined it for myself yet. But thank you, Jan, for sharing your your take on it. And I'd like to ask you, what are those five things that you would like to de-romanticize, as you <laughs> yeah, thank have you. called it? <laughs> thank you for giving us this uh, language twisters. Uh, yes. So, yeah, go ahead. Tell us. Well, first of all, you came up with the word de-romanticizing. <laughs> Second of all, those tips are, uh, I would not call them strategies. I would much more call them tips because it's not a strategy per se. Uh, First of all, do not get discouraged by the administration of starting up a business. Uh, The administrative part can actually kill you if you don't think of it the the, the right way. Second, focus on the resources you already have. Third, find professional help. Four, think big. And five, get ready for the storm because your idea is not the biggest asset you have. Okay, so we have the five tips 
that will help you expand? Because you were, of course, at also this uh, perspective of being an expat in another country, oh, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Because that's why it's expat entrepreneurship one on one. So let's dig into the first one. Tell us a little bit about this, you know, administrative thing, because that's something that I guess terrifies many people and makes them like, oh, I'd love to set up my own business. But this all this administrative procedure, I'm just not up for it. So tell us about it. Okay, so so you said that basically this is this is a terrifying part of starting up a business. And I couldn't agree more because lately I've been I've been consulting businesses, uh, startups. Well, startup per definition, those are not startups, but let's say start up businesses. And basically the main question of all of them is to how to set up a business and how do I go around around the administrative part? Um, the practical stuff that you need to set up when you when you want to open a business. And unfortunately, I've met many people who actually did not start a business just because of that. And to me, that's 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 super sad because of course, if you're an expert in a, in a, in, a, in a country where you don't know how the rules are, it's it can be really difficult to to go around the rules because maybe the rules or the laws says say something, but the reality is is something different. Do not get discouraged by that. It it all can be learned. There are counselors, there are advisors, consultants on that, and you can actually get the help for free. So. People should fail their business because they failed the, the market, not because they were scared of the administrative part. That's that's my takeaway. Yeah, actually, it's quite deep, I would say, because uh, when you look at the whole idea of having a business, if you failed or actually you failed at starting because you were afraid of a procedure, I have to tell you, it really had an impact on me when you said that this is something you have in your DNA, because I, I do like to think that everything can be learned. But there are some areas when I have my doubts. So that's why I'm, I'm reflecting on that all the time. I will make an assumption if you want to start your own business. And you have an idea, but you are discouraged by the administrative uh, procedure and you are procrastinating it or never even getting there, right? Does it mean that you might not have the entrepreneurial DNA? Because if you would have it, then you would do anything to, to make it happen. That's very true. On the other hand, many people do have the entrepreneurial DNA and they have been basically proved that in, in many parts of their lives. They just don't know about it. So... In my opinion, you can't, you cannot learn this, but you can discover it in yourself. And for instance, even true entrepreneurs, in my own definition, can be discouraged by this administrative part. And that's just, that should just not happen. But yes, in, in general, I think that even true entrepreneurs can di get discouraged, even though they actually have this mindset of, of overthinking things. So we live in Denmark. And I've read it several times already in several different places that Denmark has like the easiest procedure in the world to actually set up, start all your own business. What's your reflections on that? Couldn't agree more. Definitely. Um, I have a business started in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I had one previously and I have another company opened uh, just recently. And the procedure there takes about three weeks to one month. And there is, sorry to curse, but shitload of stuff you need to go through. You need to do your papers, you need to talk to your auditors, uh, lawyers, you know, stuff like that. And you don't need to do that in Denmark. You can open a business within five minutes if you know what to write in. So that's super simple. Also, you can start up a business with just one krona as a, as a, as a start in capital, which is great. That's a, that's a huge opportunity. I mean, the law is probably going to change that in a, in a, in a few years uh, because there are probably going to be some restrictions on how to open a business because it's super easy and people just exploit that in a, in a bad way. But I would say it's super easy to start a business in Denmark. And if you're discouraged by the procedure in Denmark, trust me, if you start a business in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, probably Poland or all other, you know, other countries when the procedure is not the same or at least similar, you wouldn't pass that. You wouldn't go through that. So it's, it's really easier than you think, at least here in Denmark. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So guys, don't get discouraged with the procedure. But what can you do? Well, I think it maybe touches upon in your point number three. What can you do if you are yes, struggling with point number one? So maybe we can leave it for later. So 
Let's have a look into the point two. Look for resources you already have. It's the easiest way for you to develop an expertise. Okay, so I would say focus on those resources that you already have. Because, and I've seen it many, many times, people try to invent fire because they have this romantic idea of starting up a business, getting an investment, and then selling it after a couple of years for billions. The thing is, many people who have an idea uh, or, or the aspiration of starting up a business, they already have the resources, all the resources they need to start up a business at their hand. They just don't know about it. And here comes the great thing of being an expat, uh, being, a, being a foreigner, an international in Denmark. We have so much power in our hands and we just don't know about it. Guess what? For instance, if you're if you're Stoyan, right, and you would like to start up a business uh, from Bulgaria, people in Bulgaria would die, they would kill to be here in Denmark and actually know the market and know how things work and be able to connect the markets. But they don't. They're not here. They don't have the opportunity to exploit that. So I'll give you an example. When I came here, I knew about the business Be Wooden that is, you know, operating in the Czech Republic. Why would I go and produce those products myself if I can just grab their products from the country where I'm originally from, speaking the language, knowing the mentality, knowing the culture, and bringing it here into the country where I live, where I'm learning the culture, and where I can use my network? This is so great opportunity that people just do not realize. I mean, connecting those markets is the, is the easiest way how to start a business. In my case, for instance, I started as a distributor. You don't need to deal with the production. You don't need to deal with the design of the product. You just connect markets. You just resell. And why would, just, why would I just you know, start in something that I've never been before? That's just, I don't know, people, I think that people have this, this you know, boxed mindset that if you're an entrepreneur, if you want to start a business, it has to be something completely new, something, something innovative. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, I love that people have those aspirations and, you know, initiation, but you don't have to. That it's, 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 not, it's not necessary. That's one thing. Second thing, why would you try to set up a business in something that you have never done before? Speaking of which, I was a summer camp instru instructor when I was 16, 17. And in there, my, my program was to entertain kids and create a program for them. Based on that, I actually developed my very first business, which was laser game, laser tech arena, where I had to build the arena myself just for the listeners, both of my hands are left. So you can imagine it was, it was not good. It wasn't going smoothly, but we actually had to build because we didn't have money to, to buy the regular equipment, which is a lot of money. So we actually had to build the equipment ourselves, going into techniques, going into like building those guns and receivers and, you know, dealing with the signal and stuff like that. Why the hell did I do that? I had, I have no technical background, I, nothing. That was the first think that I learned the hard way. Like, why didn't I start, you know, doing programs for, for kids just like I did when I was at the summer camp? Why did I go into something that I've never tried before? Stupid thing. I mean, we succeeded in the end because there were other partners joining, but hell, don't be stupid. Just, 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 just go for stuff that you already know. I think that many people, because, you know, when you talk about resources, when I hear resources, I think many people think about materials, supplies, uh, money, capital, and they don't really uh, consider resources as things like network, experience. Absolutely. You know, and I think that there is something about a, a specific particular word, resources. Marta, don't you think that we have more material, uh, materialistic view on resources. So I think what has helped me, of course, is the resource management uh, in relation to human resource management. So I have managed to kind of already connect it with the human factor. But I think it's, it's something that we easily forget, that we actually do have a lot of resources because we don't even sit down with ourselves and try to write down what it is that we already have and being creative around that process and being actually like, even looking to your childhood, like you've mentioned, like you were a young guy and you build a program for kids. 
that's already something that you can build on in the future so many times. Like I discovered that when I was a kid, I used to love doing radio. Yeah, I was uh, sitting and recording hours and hours. And you really can have so many things already naturally and easily, something that you have already developed as a child, as a teenager in your studies and so on, but you forget about it. So sitting down and writing down those things that you already have and being open-minded and creative in that process is definitely something that can show you like, whoa, I had no idea that I actually already had so much. Spot on, spot on answer. And then there is something that I would like to mention and it's called MVP, Minimum Viable Product. When people start up a business, they typically dream about having an investment. From my personal experience, I can because I have an investor in the company and I can tell you it's not that awesome. You have You have a bear behind your back constantly poking you, asking, okay, so where is my investment? Like, when do I get the money back? How How is the performance? Why didn't you do 190% growth in the last three months instead of, you know, what you promised? So do you you already have the resources to start up a business the min, on the minimum scale possible at your hand right now. You do not need an investment. You can start with with a small product, the smallest one. Test it on the market. See how it goes. Test your assumptions. Test your hypotheses. Come back. Go back into the office, into your into your room. Work on that. Develop and go back to the market. Test it. And this way, evolve. And trust me, people will be able to pay for even the pilot product if it's good enough. So you do not need an investment because you already have what you need. Okay, I, I just have to ask, uh, Jan, why the hell laser tag? You said that you you are not a technical, you were not a technical guy at that time. From where did you got exactly this idea? Was it some kind of a childhood dream of yours? No, um, and frankly, I don't like laser tag. Um, <laughs> what? I've never played it before. It was because I have this. Okay, sorry, into law. Uh, we're in Denmark. I know that we're not supposed to brag and you know tell that we're good at something, but I really believe that I'm good at spotting opportunities on the market. I knew that there were laser tech arenas all around the country, but not in my city. So that's why I partnered up with the guy and we were like, you know what, we've never done this before. Uh, let's just build the airplane on the, on, the, on, the, on the way down. But there is a spot on the market. It, it goes perfectly. Like the, this, if I call it sector, uh, was on a race. So why not just, you know, jump on the train and get something out of that? And <laughs> till this day, I really appreciate this 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 experience. But then again, I didn't like laser tech. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but you appreciate it because it, it did pull through. You did make a business and it was, uh, it was, uh, you, you, you completed your laser tech arena, I assume, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. We, we, we started with the equipment that we built ourselves Soon after that, we'd made enough of money to actually buy some, you know, official equipment with a little bit of a financial help that we got from like the third partner who came into the into the business. And then when I felt like my story is over at that business, I just sold my share because it wouldn't make sense to run it from from Denmark if I, if I can't really contribute physically to the business. So I just sold it and then focused on on the businesses that I have now. Okay, would you do it again? The whole experience with laser tech? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was so much fun. Okay. I would like to jump in here because I'm like sitting and looking at a question from Manzura mm -hmm. that really ties into the topics that we were talking about, the investment and the financial support and uh, and so on. So I'd love to take this opportunity and ask a question. Manzura is asking, what are the sources of financial support for startups that don't have the option of borrowing money. Where to start? You've mentioned that, you know, investor is one thing that you could have. And it no, it's not necessarily all that awesome to have an investor. No. But what could you tell to Manzura? What could you advise her? Okay, first of all, if you really believe in your, in your idea, you really do not want to take an investor in from the very beginning. You can do so many things to actually fund your business. I know people having part-time jobs working only a couple of hours a week and then working on their businesses in the in a spare time. I know people who borrowed a little bit of a money from their families. I know people who didn't go out every Friday and Saturday going to fancy restaurants and they just saved some money to start their business. Investors should really be the last thing to, to, to consider. That's first thing. And second thing, I don't know why, but many people believe that if you have a great idea, 
investors will jump on that, even though you haven't done anything with that idea on the market. And that's just not true. Like people, investors are not stupid. They are, they are resourceful in finances for a reason, because they know how to operate their fun finances and what to invest in. They are not buying idea because idea doesn't make money on the market. That's why they are investing. You need to test your, 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 your business, this idea on the market and prove them that you know there are some results Lord. just just look at the shark tank like there are people who have never done anything with their idea and they're asking for i don't know two hundred thousand dollars for five percent equity i'll just slap them it's <laughs> i mean like <laughs> are you from the moon or what like just go to the market test it and once you have proved that you know it works fine go and look for an investor so yeah, I actually like this approach with, with testing, you know, because I think that we don't have enough testing of our uh, products and services. So I really like that you are uh, stressing this in every, you know, reflection you have, because I think many people have their ideas in their heads. And many times they think this will work because they are so convinced it will work. But uh, I, I don't think that many people test it. Yeah, so. and that, that's, that's that's a big problem among especially young entrepreneurs because for some reason millennial, millennials tend to think that we know everything, um, that we have all the knowledge that we should have for the business and that's enough. And, you know, researching and testing is not really necessary because I know it all. Then they fail because they haven't talked to their potential customers and they haven't researched the industry and they haven't researched the trends and and competitors and stuff like that. So I know it's a, it's a, it might sound really stereotypical or, or like a cliche, but really do your homework. Research at the very beginning should take up to like 70, 80% of your time, especially in Denmark. It's all about networking. Like I know businesses where people have no idea about what product they're selling. Seriously, like I know a business, I don't want to name it, but I know um, a guy who works in a company where the owner doesn't know, I'm sorry to say, shit about what they're selling as a, as a service, but only because of his network. He's able to use three, four, five terms, which are buzzwords, and companies are just jumping in for the business. So work on your network. In Denmark, it's kink. Uh, you can't move anywhere without network and do your homework really properly. That would be my, my advice. So coming back to sources of financial support for startups, your advice would be look the closest to you possible, see what it is that you can generate yourself, what, what you can save up yourself. Maybe there is someone in the family that you could borrow some money on and the investor is something that... You should consider as the last thing. I would still get back to the, to the second tip, focus on the resources you already have. So uh, I just wanted to say that thank you, Jan, for answering to Manzura's question. And we've had these uh, two great tips from you already. And uh, we will uh, talk about the three remaining tips and answer some more questions from our listeners in the next episode. So thank you so much for today, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. You are listening to You've Got 5 Options radio show, where we hopefully convinced you that 5 indeed is a magic number. To catch up with our previous programs, apply to be our guest, send us your life challenge, or just to see how do we really look like, visit our website the5options.com We hope you enjoyed this episode and that you will come for more. That's all, folks!